this is Daniel Hutchins and today we're going to be doing another mega long article discussion. So to kick off our first activity for our mega long article discussion, we're going to be talking about the Joker. Okay, so this is from comicbook.com. So okay, so DC announces the Joker with an ongoing series. It's hot off the truck just recently. Okay. DC has been releasing a lot of teases regarding its upcoming publishing future, especially coinciding with the two month future state event that will kick off early next year. And following that, it definitely seems like all bets are off in the DC Universe, and especially in Gotham City. The publisher has already announced Batman Urban Legends, a prestige format anthology series that is set to follow stories within Batman's orbit. It sounds like the hero's biggest foe is set to get his own solo adventure. Given the fact that on Tuesday, DC announced the Joker, a new monthly ongoing series that is set to follow the latest updates regarding with the Clown Prince of Crime, especially following the tumultuous events of Joker War earlier this year. This series will be anchored by main story from Batman Team, James Turlian the Fourth, and Gillian March, and also include a punchline center backup story from Team the Fourth and Sam Johns, and artist Marco Aldolfo. Okay, so, after an unthinkable attack on Gotham City, the Crown Prince of Crime has become the most wanted man in the world. The Joker is doing his best to stay several steps ahead of the wall, enforcement overseas. But, Jim Gordon, facing retirement, realizes this is the last manhunt of his life and vows to track down Gotham's worst nemesis. Completing his storied career, but there are some mysteries and deadly forces that are also on the hunt for the Joker, and they're not going to let Gordon slow him down or get in the way. Okay, so given fact that when I was approached by DC about the concept, of an ongoing series spotlighting the Joker, I thought, what would that book even look like? Someone said in a statement, I'm excited to share this story in a way that honors everything that a series about the Joker can be, while at the same time coming at it, if from an exciting, unexpected angle, I'm also thrilled to continue working with Sam and Murka to expand the punchline story we began in November and as a backup feature in this new ongoing Joker series. The Joker board was only the beginning of the terror in the mayhem we're creating. Okay, so then in the backup story by the artist aka Punchline becomes the newest resident of Blackgate Penitentiary while on the outside, Harper Rowe resumes her role as Bluebird to prevent her brother from falling under the influence of Punchline and her beguiling brand of anarchy and chaos. Okay, so the Joker will be a 40 page monthly series with a retail of $5 an issue. Okay, and the first issue will be available at comic book stores. And digital retailers beginning on March 9th of 2021. So what do you think about Joker getting his own solo series post future state? Keep scrolling then check out the covers for issue 1 and you can share your thoughts in my video below. So there's lots of different pictures on comicbook.com you can check out and yeah so that's all. Next I'm going to do another bonus Okay, so keep in mind guys that these mega long article discussions 
typically have lots and lots of bonuses. Okay. Okay. Uh, what the heck? Uh, hold on, guys. Okay, so here's another article we're going to be talking about is, we are going to be talking about Captain America. So, okay, so Marvel announces Captain America anniversary celebration. This was also just recently, a couple days ago. Okay, so Marvel Comics will celebrate 80 years of Captain America in 2021. Steve Rogers debuted in Captain America Comics No. 1 from Joe Simon and Jack Kirby in 1941. Marvel will commemorate that issue's anniversary Captain America tribute No. 1, which is a giant-sized special release in March. A Captain America tribute No. 1 has top Marvel creators redrawn and modernizing Captain America's first appearance in Captain America Comics No. 1 as we introduce into the Marvel Universe and Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Avengers number 4. This includes his first battle against Red Skull and a Silver Age debut as he awakes from suspended animation and joins Earth's Mice Heroes we know as a member of the Avengers. The issue features artwork by John Cassidy, Marvel Silver Age, David Lapham, Delkin Shelby, Perf Perez, Salvador LaRocca, I know for since you, for Rain Real Schneer, and a bunch of other artists that I can't even pronounce their names. Okay, I'm not gonna waste my time saying all those names, because I'm just gonna butcher them. So, anyway, we are gonna be talking about the information. Okay, so we packed this book full of top flight artistic talent, all paying tribute to the king. Executive Editor Tom Revord said in a statement. So while you can just read these from stories, readers will be definitely going to want to savor this experience and see how each artist stacks up the original work done from Jack Kirby. Okay, so if you're excited for the Captain America anniversary tribute, let us know. And yeah, so... It goes on sale in March. Okay. So there's going to be another bonus. But first, let me step out of my seat real quick. And charge my laptop. Because the last thing you need is for me to have to restart everything. And you don't want that. So I'm plugging my laptop back in. Okay. So now... Our next bonus, we are going to be talking about, is Marvel's X-Men writer comments on controversial Fantastic Four mutant retcons. Okay, also recent, a couple days ago. Okay, so as we know, in November, Marvel Comics made controversial retcons to Franklin Richards. We know as the son of Reed and Sue Richards in the pages Fantastic Four. Okay, so we know that. So, okay. The Dan Slot written Fantastic Four number 26 revealed that Franklin is not a mutant, which had explained his cosmic power since 1982. This retcon proved controversial, especially among those following with the current era of the X Men. Franklin appeared on a list of Omega level mutants early on the run. X-Men Fantastic Four crossover seemed to be setting up future stories about Franklin's being status. Speaking to adventures in poor taste, Marvel's head of X, Jonathan Hickman, commented on how the change to Franklin's origin affects his plans. Well, part of the problem with talking about this stuff publicly is this. So one of the minor reasons that I just don't do it much anymore is because I really 
it really doesn't serve anyone to show how the sausage is made, he said. When I was writing Avengers, I was working from a tight outline. Yeah, that's understandable, but I pretty much knew where I was heading the entire run. Not everyone works that way, and it would be unreasonable for there to be an expectation that everyone worked that way, but I do. None of that changes the fact that one day I woke up and I had the deal of Old Man Steve Rogers, Superior Spider-Man, Unworthy Thor, and Iron Man a billion miles away from Earth and Guardians. These are just the natural occurring complications of writing big books at Marvel. Well, it just looks like he's just complaining, so, okay. You know, artists always complain, but we're gonna keep reading, okay. So now, obviously, we would not have laid down the track we did in House of X and Powers of X and X-Men Fantastic Four if we weren't planning on playing with that stuff. And who knows? We still might. But the truth is that Dan's story evolved, which is kind of the larger point of it all. And Dan's the writer of the Fantastic Four. He gets to write the book, and I support him the same way I'd support Leah on hers, or Zeb on his, and on and on and on. So, okay. So, velocity and volume makes the job hard enough, and none of us have the time or energy to spare on pointless territorial disputes. And at the end of the day, you're talking about characters that have been around for over 50 years. It'll be fine. So, Franklin's powers weren't always considered a mutation. The first hint that he may be... One came from the classic X-Men story, Days of Future Past, where he had married Rachel Summers and was with her in one of these dystopian timelines, mutant camps. John Bryan, who drew Days of Future Past, later confirmed Franklin was a mutant during his run, Ryan and Draw on Fantastic Four. But before that, and before those stories, characters only said that Franklin was full of cosmic energy. Most presumed it was the result of cosmic rays that bombarded his parents, turning them into Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Woman. So what do you think of this retcon? Let us know. Okay, another bonus. Okay. Okay, here is something that's really, really big right now. We find out about how Guardians of the Galaxy's Star-Lord is bisexual. Okay, this was a couple days ago. If there's one thing you know about Ally Wayne, is the writer might be one of the most ambitious creators actively writing in comics. When it comes to Guardians of the Galaxy number 9, the scribe rewrote history of one of the most famous Guardians of the Galaxy in an ambitious tale that helped to turn the character's mythos on its head as we know it. Furthermore, the issue established a fantasy-fueled world existing outside the primary Marvel Universe, long thought dead, seemingly killed off all the way back in an E-Wing and Ron Cable's Guardians of the Galaxy number 4, readers find out in the latest Guardians issue, Peter Quill was simply transported into an alternate dimension, all thanks to magic involved with his elemental gun. It's here that readers see the first inclination of Star-Lord being bisexual. Okay, so after using this elemental gun to rid Earth-616, of the New Olympians, Quill was teleported to a mysterious new land called Marinius, a city-state built on the back of a massive sea turtle. It's here that Quill ends up spending hundreds of years and he learns more about the land a couple that rescued him. Aradia and Morris, as the story goes, one year in the Quill's arrival in Marinius, a couple invites him to partake in, you know, usual couple festivities, still thinking he has the opportunity to return to his 
universe and rekindle his relationship with Gomorrah. Star-Lord politely declines the invitation. <laughs> Fast forward to a decade, and Quill realizes he's likely stuck on Marinius. That's when he decides to submit to a love triangle, get an intimate in the reflective Marinius pool in a neon-soaked scene. You're newborn and ready to learn our ways. Okay, so some 130 years after the fact, the new Olympians managed to find the trio on Marinius and pursue them for the next decade. In one of these panels, in the midst of a chase sequence, Aradia can be seen pregnant, coupled with the fact Quill asks Aradia some time later to make sure Rocky's alright. It's completely possible Quill could be a new father as well. The story will continue in the next issue, and going to Galaxy number 10, a King and Black tie-in, due to the next month, the solicitation text that can be found in below in this article on comicbook.com. Okay, so, number bonus. So the next bonus is Star Wars Rogue Squadron isn't adapting games or books, says Patty Jenkins. Okay, so Patty Jenkins is directing Star Wars Rogue Squadron for Lucasfilm, but the film won't retell the stories in a popular video games or books of the same name. Okay, so Lucasfilm revealed the new Star Wars movie project during this week's Walt Disney Company Investor Day. During interviews, with IGN ahead of the debut of Wonder Woman 1984 on HBO Max in theaters. Jenkins clarified that she's not basing her film on those popular past Rogue's, Rogue Squadron stories. Okay, so in the Star Wars Rogue Squadron movie, we're doing something original with great influence from the games and books, Jenkins said. There's a lot of things being acknowledged and understood about the greatness of all those things. But yes, it's an original story, and I'm so psyched to do it. Okay. The Rogue Squadron game series was a series of titles available on PC and Nintendo consoles developed by LucasArts and Factor 5, the arcade space combat series. Started with players taking control of a titular Rebel Alliance fighter squad, under the command of Luke Skywalker during the events of the original trilogy. The first Rogue Squadron release on PCs in Nintendo 64 in 1998, Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader followed in 2001 on Nintendo GameCube launch title, and Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike in 2003 added ground combat, multiplayer, and non-linear story progress. So, okay, so Rogue Squadron was also the subject of a series of novels and comic books, both titled Star Wars X-Wing, and written by Michael Stackpole. Unlike the games, these stories took place after the original Star Wars trilogy. They followed a new Rogue Squadron under command of Reggie Antilles after Luke left the group to focus on rebuilding the Jedi Order. There were 10 entries in this novel series and 35 issues of the Dark Horse comic series. Due to the fact that these stories took place in the old Star Wars expanded universe, now published under the non-canon Star Wars Legend banner, that frees Jenkins up to do whatever she wants with Rogue Squadron, if her method is anything like how Star Wars film and television have been treated with Star Wars Expanded Universe, there will still be plenty of old touchstones used for inspiration in this new movie. Okay, so are you excited about Star Wars Rogue Squadron movie? And it's supposed to open in theaters in December 2023. Now I know that's about two or three years away. But like I said, good comes com good things come when you wait. So like I said, that's that old saying. Good things come when you wait. So there's going to be another bonus. Okay. Right now, we only 20 minutes in this video so far, so I want to try to hit 
at least 40 or 50. Okay. So we're going to be doing a couple more bonuses. Okay. There is a lot of information, my friends. There is a lot of information. Okay. Next information we're talking about is Iron Fist. Exclusive previews of Marvel Iron Fist Heart of the Dragon series. Okay. Earlier this year, Marvel announced that not only will Iron Fist return in his own solo comic series, but that the legendary writer will be bringing his signature flair for a comic book combat to a character. Comicbook.com had an exclusive look at three pages from this series, titled Iron Fist Heart of the Dragon, featuring on Bodies artist, and you can find the three page previews below. Hama and Wacha are well known to comic readers for their work in martial arts books. Hama best known for his long runs writing Wolverine and G.I. Joe, while Wacha was a regular artist for IDW publishing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle series. It's a match made in Kung Fu Heaven. Scheduled to premiere in January of next year, an official Synopsis of this book reads, Someone is killing the ancient dragons that power the heavenly cities, and only Iron Fist and the deadly weapons can stop them. If they can discover who they are in time. Zombie armies, mystical portals, dragon hearts, some of them Marvel Universe's deadliest fighters, all converge in one action pack extravaganza, and a fate of all worlds hang in the balance. Larry Hama and David Washer are building a story that hits as hard as Iron Fist himself. Iron Fist, Heart of the Dragon, will mark Iron Fist's first new comic series since the digital first Iron Fist fan wrapped in 2018. That series saw Danny Rand wrestling with the guilt over his inability to save a child. This new series announcement is sure to be happy news for fans of Marvel's Living Web. And there's a very, very cool picture below. Um, so are you excited about Iron Fist, Heart of the Dragon series? Let us know. Okay, number bonus. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of information. Lots of information. Okay. Okay. We don't want to go that far. Uh, okay. I just jumped ahead for a second and I realized there's 800 articles on comicbook.com. So, I want to try to go to more recent things. Okay. 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 So, this was also, like, a while ago. So, Marvel just made the X-Men a cosmic level threat. Marvel just made the X-Men and their fellow mutants a cosmic level threat. Thanks to the game-changing events of Marvel's new X-Men title, Sword, and Sword Number 1 now on sale, the X-Men and their mutant nation of Kokoa unveiled the latest extension of the Sovereign Nation, the Old Sword, an orbital station which the Summers Clan, Cyclops, Jean Grey, and Cable claimed for the X-Men during the events of X of Swords crossover. However, the bold advancements Sword Director Abigail Brand and her team of mutants have achieved on the station will shake the balance of cosmic power in Marvel Universe. Warning, there are Marvel Sword number one spirals that follow. One of the biggest pieces of intrigue in Marvel House of X reboot of the X-Men has been the method of mutant immortality. Developed on the Kokoa Nation, the five the X-Men have figured out a way to combine the powers of several unique mutants 
to create a resurrection process that allows any moon to be recreated after death with the mind and powers all downloaded from backups. That concept has snowballed into a larger idea of Kokoa's means, finding even more bold ways to combine and sequence their powers, whether it be for combat or more. Expansive vision that Abigail Brand is going for. And the crux of sword number one is Abigail Brand showing Magneto who new concept that builds on the five, the six, using another combination of unlike Mune abilities from some surprising returning characters. Brand essentially creates Mune Expedition Team, capable of traveling to the most extreme cosmic regions of the Marvel Multiverse, and bring artifacts back with them. In fact, the first expedition that Brand puts together results in Kokoa getting some kind of pyramid object from the depths of creation itself and they intend to use that for the benefit of Kokoa and all of humankind. Okay, so however in accomplishing this impossible fet, Kokoa may have just put a massive target on humankind's back. Okay, so... X-Men now have the power to locate, travel to, and retrieve any cosmic power across the Marvel Multiverse, and they can get their hands on We've seen time and time again cosmic cubes, infinity stones, and the like that when mortal beings tend to tamper with big cosmic powers, the universe tends to take notice, and not in a friendly way. So, sword number one is now on sale through Marvel Comics. Okay. Another bonus. And right now, the time check is 27 minutes. Okay. Okay, so another article about the X-Men. X-Men spin-off Children of the Atom is delayed again. Okay, so Marvel Comics is delaying its X-Men spin-off Children of the Atom for a second time. Marvel first solicited the series for release in April 2020. The direct Marcus pandemic shutdown caused Marvel to delay the series and eventually we set its debut for January of 2021. Okay, so the second issue of the series wasn't in the company's February solicitations. Now the publisher has rescheduled the first issue for release in March of 2021. Written by some artists, Children of the Atom focuses on a team of new teenage mutants living on a mutant island nation Kokoa. Marvel build the series as an introduction of the X-Men's first ever sidekicks. Okay. X-Men is supposed to be something that, if you know, is important to us now. And previously we released some trailers for the series. And so, what is more now than Zoomers? One of them has a TikTok, and one of them has a fitness Insta. One of them is basically the moderator for Mutant subreddit. One of them is a cosplayer, and one of them makes Mutant music. For so long, it's like larger media in the X-Men universe is like, mutants are bad, and like X-Men are evil because they're mutants, and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what would Zoomers think of that? They wouldn't. They'd be like, no, they're great. But also, you know, it's an X-Men comic. There's going to be powers, and there's going to be punching, there's going to be bad guys, and all kind of stuff. But aren't really, really brought the thunder on this. It's really incredibly dynamic. X-Men has some of my first comics ever, and to be able to play in that universe 
and also to be able to add to that universe is really a dream come true. It's almost like the kids in our perspective. So anything that you didn't know or you don't know, you're discovering it through these kids. And I don't think we've seen this perspective in X-Men comics before. I think people could really super dig it. While fans will wait for Children of the Atom debut, someone will take over writing the ongoing New Mutant series with issue number 14 in December. Okay, so that wraps that article up. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Okay, Daredevil 25 sold out. Marvel announces second printing with new covers exclusives. Okay, Marvel Daredevil has been hidden on all cylinders and it threw everyone for a loop when Matt Murdock decided to surrender himself and stay in jail. To set an example for other vigilantes, Elektra was also quite shocked and after the events of issue 25, she is trying to earn his trust in the only way she knows how. And that is by becoming the new Daredevil. Oh, great. So the big reveal made issue number 25 a hot commodity. And now Marvel's sending it back to print with two gorgeous variant covers. And you can get your ex exclusive first looks below. I'm so excited issue 25 is the beginning of a massive new chapter in Daredevil history. And yet, it, we didn't relaunch with a new number one. Wow, 2020 is weird, y'all. Okay. So, there's a picture below. But for real, I'm so grateful we're getting to tell these kinds of stories. And that the readers are there for it. People have been producing career-defining art for this book. And we're just getting started. Daredevil in 2021 is going to take us to places no superhero comic has ever gone before. You can find solicitation details for a second printing below, and stylish covers can be found in images from above. But of course, you gotta check them out on this page on comicbook.com. Okay. So, yeah. There you go. That is that article. Time check is 33 minutes in this video right now so we're going to be doing a few more and then wrap this up okay ba -ba -ba -ba. whoa i went too far down all right we're going to page three Okay, Batman Catwoman number one features a Mark Hamill Easter egg. Okay, Batman Catwoman, Tom King's long-awaited follow-up to his Batman run with artist Clayman has finally arrived. The ambitious series has three distinct time periods throughout, including the past when the Bat and the Cat first fell in love with each other, the present where they've tied the knot, but an old flame returns to potentially ruin things. And the future, where Cat is out for revenge in the world, where Bruce has passed away. 
A wrinkle in their plans, though, and each of these times is none other than the Crown Prince of Crime himself. The Joker, in addition to masking the reference to Mask of the Phantasm canon, the issue also features a pointed reference to that animated film version of the Joker, Mark Hamill. Spoilers below. The future section of the series sees an older Selina Kyle reunited with an unknown old friend. Though his identity isn't first revealed, the pair reminisce about the old days talking about the kids and circuses as how Bruce died. But by the issue's end, it revealed that this old friend is not, in fact, none other than Joker, retired to a trailer park in Florida. If now eager to kill the other with Batman no longer in the picture. Now that we have all that, we can point out the deep cut Easter egg embedded from this issue. Which, frankly, could be a coincidence, but perhaps it isn't. The Joker reveals in his talks with Selina that one of his children is named Nathan. Okay, so something he shares in common with voice actor Mark Hamill, who famously brought the Joker to life in Batman anime series and a Mask of Phantasm. We already know that from Tom King Query had the affinity for the Mask of Phantasm based on what he's chosen to include from the series. But it runs even deeper, apparently as he brings the real-life children of that Joker into DC canon. Okay, so the second issue of Batman Catwoman isn't scheduled to arrive until February of 2021. The full solicitation for the next issue reads... Phantasm has come to Gotham City. Andrea Brumont, the one-time love of Bruce Wayne, is working for her lost child. She's pretty sure the Joker's involved. So who better to have as an ally than Batman? And what better way to get to Batman than through Catwoman? It's a knotted history for this costume quartet. Spanning past, present, and future. What the Joker did to Selina Kyle at the beginning of her career will have deadly consequences at the end of their lives. Tom King's ultimate tale, The Dark Knight, kicks in the high gear as the story roars down the avenues, only hinted at the pages of this Batman. So there you go. That is that article. Time check. 38 minutes. Okay. So we're doing one more article. being very selective about what we're talking about. So, just remember that. Okay, the last article for this discussion. Marvel Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker comic adaptation, reportedly cancelled. Now this was from last month. Okay, so, after months of delays, a new report from Preview World seemingly confirms that a comic book adaptation of Star Wars Rise of Skywalker for Marvel Comics will no longer be released as monthly series. The series was originally slated to debut earlier in the year, only for the coronavirus pandemic to cause a number of complications, not only with the publishing of comics, but also with their sale. Due to comic book sales closing their doors for months, despite these setbacks, Marvel has yet confirmed the news. Officially, with it also being possible that the adaptation could be released as one comprehensive book as opposed to monthly issues. 
Okay, so a collected release for the adaptation would seem more likely as artist Will Tilney teased earlier this year. After a number of delays, the book wasn't cancelled and that he was excited for fans to see it. Okay, so in this regard, it would seem unlikely that creators would be enlisted and seemingly pay for their work just for a project to be entirely scrapped. Okay. So as a lifelong Star Wars fan, it was an honor to be asked to be part of wrapping up the Skywalker Saga with Marvel Comics. Writer Jody Hauser shared with Marvel.com about the adaptation. We have some fun plans to add scenes and material that weren't seen in the movie. Okay, so the site adds, in addition to the shock and twist and turns that were present in this film, five issue limited series would have also had a brand new story material for readers to enjoy. The Rise of Skywalker served as a culmination of the entire Skywalker saga, which kicked off back in 1977 with the original Star Wars. Not only did the film have conclude the sequel trilogy of films, but also the nine-episode journey with characters over the course of decades making it nearly impossible to impress all fans. While the comic adaptation might not entirely reimagine the series finale, it could follow a tradition of other adaptations and include unique insight into sequences that could change the audience's perception of certain events. You can stay tuned for the comic adaptation of Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker from other people on various research sites such as comicbook.com. But if you are disappointed by this news, let us know in the comments or you can directly contact Patrick Cavanaugh directly on Twitter and talk all things Star Wars and horror. Okay. So yeah, anyhow guys, on a long note, I hope you enjoyed this mega long article discussion, and you guys have a nice day. Bye.